Um, I'd like to have Ala Vachakova of the English Parliament to come up and talk about a couple of things that you guys would be interested in. So we're just going to have a series of introductions. I'm going to introduce Stephanie, and Stephanie will have to invite to a summer uh, so we're going to be quick. Uh, I just wanted to make a couple of quick announcements because we've been really working hard with Stephanie and a couple of students on a new project. We are a very active program, as you know, from the impressive list of events coming up uh, in the next few weeks. Um, but there was, well, in a sense, that the sense of community is somewhat lacking. So we're trying to build a better community of uh, English majors and minors, but also English department and faculty. So the couple of things that I would like you to do, how many of you are majors or minors, or how many of you are right? Wonderful. So the first thing that I want you to do, I want you, <coughs> I want you to like our department page on Facebook, because this is where we are going to post all our assignments for informal events, like gatherings, parties, uh, teas. We're going to start a series of English department teas. So how many of you? like our Facebook page. Not too bad, not too bad. So the rest of you, that's your homework assignment. The link is available on, on our HWS page on the right side. Be a fan of Facebook, it's a large icon, it's the largest I could get. <laughs> I had to pay for it from another pocket. So do that. Um, <laughs> um, so next week, we're going to start um, an English department night, study night, is going to happen in Black Hawk Room at uh, 8 o'clock, right? So I encourage you to come out and let Stephanie talk a little bit about this event. Um, the other thing, on April 23rd, which is three weeks from today, we're going to have our first English department team. So look out for an for announcement. And the poster on Facebook, I'm also going to send an email. And the topic for the first team, it's going to be an informal thing, an informal gathering, students, talking with faculty about a topic, us sharing ideas about the topic. The topic, I think, is fascinating and something that everybody could say something about. It's called writing and pain. <laughs> <laughs> Other options we considered were writing and masochism, writing and suicide. <laughs> So now I'm going to introduce Stephanie, who is kind of uh, the person <coughs> leader of that new initiative. So. Hi, I'm a first year, but I'm also an English major. Um, the idea behind this project is to bring English majors, minors, and people who are interested in becoming them together, because I think the English department comprises some of the most unique and brilliant people on this campus. And I know you all agree. <laughs> And we want to get to know each other outside of class. So next Wednesday, we're going to be having an English major night in the Blackwell room with pizza. So we get ready for that. It's at 8 o'clock. Um, it's also going to coincide with a Thal meeting. So we're going to share the Demarest building. And you know, it's, it'll be a really casual, just drop in event. And I hope to see you there. Anyone's invited. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce Piotr Song, who will introduce me. Yes. <laughs> Of the inside of an apple, his 
last book published in 2013, which I didn't even know about until a few months late after it came out last year. To my ear, this particular book transcends in a remarkable way what he was doing earlier, so I will just say a few words about it. On one hand, it's the level of individual poems. These rather brief pieces are more consistently spatial than in other Joshua Beckman's books, which I have seen. Because of that, his meditations are able to breathe fuller breath, and there is also more mobility there. They swing freely, if not quite move freely, we wish to express our concern here, that they will not fly out of the book one day, leaving us alone in panic about what to do. In other words, the text or the printed space <coughs> collaborates with or is assisted by the empty spaces on the same page. What swings or moves or dances is both the text and the empty space. There's a bit of ballet that way. The spacing is interestingly functional, and it, is and it certainly is at least partly about sound. There is yet another space, the most important one, I think, consistently refined throughout the whole book, the space of sound. The aim and the result is that none of these spaces works on its own, none is disconnected from the others, and that the sonic experience is also subtle and strong. This, it's the balance that matters, displaced proportionately between how the poem looks, what empty spaces it needs, what words and sounds it wants, between what the poem is observing, what it is meditating on, and perhaps also, am I not being too brave, what it is saying, even though it does not have to stem from any idea of theme, idea or theme, or it may not want to appear as stemming from such body things. It's good to mention here that Joshua Beckman co-edited with Matthew Zafrud, there were a very lively anthology of polit political poems called State of the Union, which uses the body themes and says things. On the other hand, and on the other level, these deceptive <coughs> ascetic poems expand unnoticeably to prolonged, meditative, untitled, and yet sophisticatedly coherent sequences. Both famous hands. Now, both levels, the level of individual poems and the level of longer units, point to where Beckman's writing now is, what his priorities are, and how gracefully he's able to combine some of his old aspirations in a new way. Is this what the soft inside of the apple has? I think so, among other things. Where? Did he come from this <coughs> Joshua Beckman? From Whitman and Dickinson through Williams and the Beats, for example? Yes, from Whitman and Dickinson through Williams and the Beats. <laughs> Yet perhaps from more interesting beats than the most famous ones, and more experimental, who are only now slowly getting a somewhat bigger audience. But are such poets as Larry Eigner or John Wieners, even Pete's. From the New York school poets, perhaps, of the so-called first and the so-called second generations. Yes, from the New York school too, including Frank O'Hara, and to my foreign ear, also James Schuyler, the master of shimmering particulars <coughs> and light touch meditations. And it's also the spirit of collaboration that, it, that is so valid for them. And will I dare to say that I also sense the shadows of all the news? But then who am I to be telling you all, the real connoisseurs of American poetry, about how Joshua Beckman's poetic lineage is shaped? I could only bring him here, <laughs> and I'm very happy to have done so. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you my last invitee this academic year, 
one of the most truly experimental poets in the States and one of the most interesting personalities in American letters, the editor of Wave Publishers, translator of Jorge Carrera Andrade, of Carlos Oquendo de Ama, as well as of Tomáš Chalamón, who was our real last semester, and a great collaborator with others, especially with Matthew Roger, and also a farmer once, simply and without any deception, cultivating vegetables. <laughs> yes, it's all the same man, Joshua Beck. <laughs> Quit 
and unextinguished like stupid child in a box, a lamp, a fire, a scroll, and a wastebasket made from the body of a tree. In my chair I waited while on some mountain nearby there was cold, beautiful snow, I was certain. Silver streamers, dazzling winter. I let my body down slow, which is what they say to do, like a whale with its breathing and floating in the ocean. Yesterday was the half moon, and today was basically the half moon too. A glacier's blue, and water in the middle of a lake is blue. I only had one day during which I could get myself out into the middle of it, and I did. Kudos to me. And to the Brazilian goose who never feels cold, and to the talky crow who has so many friends, and to the inspiring stealthy ducks who fly together in clips above water. It's a silly betrayal of my own thoughts to invent or remember. So maybe I'll just close with these tender lines of Henry David Thoreau. An oak tree in Hubbard's passage stands absolutely motionless and dark against the sky. In the air along the river sailed beauty and cuspish the swallow, sweet brown dirt caked in the banks made us think, and the water which surrounded our legs made us feel, and then the boats drifted back into the hollow. Sympathy excited is the basis of remarkable love. And friendship, as was classically described with a kind of current ever changing its form, translates as object made of stone or clover. They're so strange with their cut-off arms and noses. How vacant is the real unseen stare. They want to call it dead, but dead's too much alive. Things made tart, not to eat, but to peel off with my teeth and taste it then. As Russin calls him, some fall sea look dirty, I guess, hanging from otherwise lovely trees and falling onto the still green grass one last time piggish and round.
reflex of another fleeing naked ass in apartment. Cold, rose, soap, I'm naked too and sick. A kind of blood song falls out of me. Damp, sprung, run of dirty clothes play on my bed in lamplight, August 28th. Summer's Alaska crooked on the wall and clapping of dishes in the woo-woo kitchen <coughs> put me to sleep, chilly or no. Rainstones curved and washed right down the cold water's big white sound wrapped in cloth and cough for sending. I leave my bed and there you are where the shirt's balled up in the lawn by the poppies. Flowers from the outside now full of living water like a cloud. Stations formed and made on beachy sands and waiting there I saw the lightened streaks of sun laid down upon the paling rock and lay myself upon it too. Those desert creatures each so still then watch them move. Confident 
I had forgotten everything and useless sick. I wandered with Anthony through the desert, looking at white, dried out shrubs and crushing tinny rocks with feet. Light brown desert full of bushes and light. Clapping, <coughs> clapping, happy and here, and sound is what the world has made of itself, being loud and also playing. A way to call things booming out into the skies, and open mouth blows a bubble of what it says. Hazy, warm presence of us two, being ourselves, each as a thin thing. Our bodies devised it and then made it what it said, oh, and together. Moonlights out windows and seas, large, dark scale on beach like reeds. We sway and pulse expectantly at night. The things we do, we see. Off of and the 
things you saved up for dreams came down speaking. No strange light has led making little marks on the field, on the tree where wasps the smoky bluish air. I am not encumbered by those things which the flattened and banking leaves beneath your spread coat or tent. I'm going to call this problem windows. Windows, windows. Repeat a strange song in head until bus comes. The red light wire, which is like a needle thread through the ear of a sleeping girl or boy I can never tell, hung there thinly dazzling. I'm going to call this poem porch light. Porch light, porch light. Over the hillside with magnificent ritual, they strode, their eyes scanning the treetops to see a branch ripe for a funeral box, the grass hinge and the fire fluttering. Sitting on that chair, a peg above my head. Toward the beach, the waves were crashing, and periodically a drop of water would be thrown into the air and land on the stem of beach grass. This happened in the morning and in the night. It happened at times the moon was shining. It was, and at times, a burning white gray sky that is also water. One lost arrow stretched out in a line. Two, two, cried the ghost of the little girl who was dead, now attacked by sun, and so called out. Wooden slatted bridge as into town, and the ground took parts of a bottle back.
the experience of writing this book, uh, which was many years and somewhat solitary experience, when the book came out, I think my expectation or my hope was that it would, um, when people had it on their own, that they would read it aloud, that they would read it aloud to themselves, and that they would read it aloud to others. And um, what I found when I talked to people was that they mostly didn't do that. Um, which, once you publish something, you send it off into the world. That's you know, whatever happens. <laughs> um, and I don't know what, uh, I'm not exactly sure why I wanted that from these poems. I think that for me, the experience of reading poems aloud is, um, is the experience of poems for me, the moment of reading those poems aloud is the actual poem itself, that the thing held in the book is something that just allows the poem to exist at some later date, uh, and allows the poem, which is the, the other thing, the story, or we were, we were talking, I think it was yesterday, we were talking about the spoken thing that's happening inside you, even if you're not, even if you're not doing it aloud. That, that it allows that moment, that time passing, to happen. And, um, and I guess that uh, after, after they went out, they went out into the world and I wanted that to happen and it kind of didn't happen, I started making other poems. And these poems demand to be read aloud. Um, they can't actually be read silent. Um, which is hard to explain, and so I'm going to now try and explain that, <laughs> what that could actually mean. Um, I made the, I made a kind of poem that you could look at on the page. This is this is it. This is one of them, and you could look at it, and you could have some sense of what it says in your in your mind in your head, um, but that the only way to read it is to follow the words and to hear them aloud. And you'll see that what happens, you'll, I, I write them such that you read them vertically down, and then you read a bunch more, and it's a little hard to explain, but I will, I will get to that in a moment. Um, but then you can't really see how the words group together and come together in phrases or in, in fragments without hearing them, um, without hearing them. So, that's what I've done. That's what I did after I finished doing all of this. And I think also, after reading that aloud, I think, oh yes, I wanted also to make something that demanded uh, the presence of other people in my life when I was reading poems. That um, the experience of making these was a very uh, solitary one. And even reading them feels like a somewhat solitary one. And. Um, and that I wanted poems that, that needed others. So, one of the things I need is uh, someone else. So, for the second part of the reading here, I'm going to invite people up to help me read them and to, um, to whom I will explain how to read them. You bear with me because what I'll do is I will shift over like this. I will invite someone should come up here and I will show them how to read the poem, and then they'll read the poem to you. And together, hopefully, we will explain and read the poem. So would anyone like to come up and uh, read the poem with me? OK?
clipped even after night ducked calmly away. So you down the first call. Story of lost afternoon clipped even after night ducked calmly away. And there's no punctuation. So you have to kind of hear your way through. So I usually do the first one a few times until I get the feel for it. Okay. And then, then you go to the second you go, story told of coin lost one afternoon in clipped shrubs, even calling, or story told of coin lost one afternoon in clipped shrubs, even crawling after you, night came, ducked out, calmly down, done away with. Okay. And then, story told me of coin purse lost one long afternoon in summer, clipped shrubs greeny, even <coughs> spiders after uh, clipped shrubs greeny. Even I've, I've written these and I have to <laughs> try and figure them out as I'm reading. Clipped shrubs greeny, even crawling spiders after you called night came. Night came. I ducked out and calmly done then away with thought. And then four. Story told me to of coin purse stole lost one long sparkling afternoon in summer, glowing, clipped shrubs greeny, and even crawling spiders seen after you. Called that night, came I did, ducked out and so calmly done then, gone away with thoughts jangling. And then last Story told me to stay, of coin purse stole for God, lost one long sparkling of afternoon and summer, glowing memory, clipped shrubs, greeny and waving, even crawling spiders to please. After you called that night, night came, I did it, ducked out and so left, calmly done, gone away, away with thoughts jangling on. What's happening here is you read down the first column, and then you read the first and second, and then you read the first, second, third, and then you read the first, second, third, fourth. Is that right? Yes, I do. Evening songs closed in on me. Lydia's first day, it's evening, and really slow, stretch like tight ropes occupying alleyways. Night's project, earliest hours, hours long, hear us act stunned again. Evening songs soared, closed in as on me, that's Lydia's first. As day, it's gone, evening and well. Really slow songs stretched like moonlight, tight ropes found occupying alleyways as nights project. Continued earliest hours, first hours long thought, we're here, here, <coughs> again, stunned, again, again. Evening songs soared forth, closed in as thoughts on me, that's right. Lydia's first as first day, it's gone, hope, awry, evening and well come. Really slow songs mounting, stretched like moonlight shadows. Tight ropes found out, occupying alleyways as sound. Night's project continued as earliest hours, first quiet hours. Long thought, thoughts are here, here, here. Us act again, again, stunned again, again, again. Yeah.
drop it over or ring. And I do it until I kind of hear it. April wrapped, April, April wrapped normal image, not good, drop over or ring. Then April days wrapped in normal gauze, image of not for good or drop on over then or later, ring to. April day's house, wrapped in vines, normal gauze flowers, image of life, not for the good or bad, drop on leave, over then shown or later on, ring too much. April day's house sitting, wrapped in vines, my normal gauze flowers wither, image of life cues, not for the average good or bad guy. Drop on leaf stem over them shown up or later on with ring too much, right? Okay. You do the first one as many times as it takes to feel comfortable. And once you get <laughs> as comfortable as you can feel. And then once you do that, it's like you get the feel of it and then you can kind of go ahead. But if at any point you can you can go back and start with it. And that repetition is part of the puzzle. Okay. So you can just, yeah, shuffle around. How do I say? 
Goons rule arcades, star scenery, excitement, so got real, adverse story, sucks, everything sucks. I'm gonna try that one again. <laughs> Goons rule arcade star, scenery, excitement, so got real, adverse story, sucks, everything sucks. <laughs> Goons gone. Rule, crazy, arcade, closed star. Night, scenery, day, excitement postponed. So what? Got my real book, Adverse Tones. Story really sucks, and everything that sucks grows. <laughs> Goons gone fiction. Rule, crazy, dad's arcade, closed sign. Star, night, expanse, scenery, daybreak. Excitement postponed until, so what time has got my ideas? Real book like adverse tones, interior. Story really old, sucks and bites. Everything that moves, sucks, grows, dies. <laughs> <laughs> Who's gone crazy fishing again? Rule crazy dad's time. Arcade closed, signs stolen, star night expanse. Scene scenery, daybreak, through excitement postponed until your so what time has, got my ideas done, real book, like with adverse tones, interior. That story really old fashioned sucks and bites, but everything that moves me sucks, grows, dies, bites. <laughs> single 
one word lives, like three words, five words, eight words, something like that. And I write them vertically down the page. And, and at a certain point, one day I was looking at my notebook and I was like altering one or I was, I was sort of editing it. And I had this little thing and I think my response to it was a frustration at, its, at it, how, how small it was. I just wanted, I wanted more of a poem there. And I took this little line, this little poem with one word per line, and I added a word to each line. And I thought, oh, wow, wow. that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, OK. Then I, then I added a third one. Then I added a third word down, which was even more fun, more exciting. And, um, and then I kept going. And then I realized that what was happening was essentially a thing was, was growing in each of those moments. The first one with the single words down was like a stanza. And the second was like the second stanza in which all of half of the words were shared and then so on. And, um, and really it was just so pleasurable that I continued to do it uh, all the time. Until I, until, I, until I had to like go back to work. <laughs> um, so it was really, a, it was just something that kind of, that happened. Um, yeah. You sound very fun. <laughs> yeah. How would you do those things? If you're Sorry. Like a book of those, how would you do them? That's, that's my question. That's sort of what I'm, that's sort of what we're doing. For me, that's one of the things we're doing right now, which is, um, I want to need the experience of these poems to be allowed like it's just been and sort of shared. And I think it's going to be very difficult to print a book and um, be certain that that's the experience that will happen because it very easily, one, I almost always skip over the introductions of books. I have no interest in reading that, that word. I go straight into the poems. And if someone were to do that, they would essentially be reading just the last stanza of each of these poems. And uh, that would not be a particularly fulfilling experience. So I don't know the answer yet. Uh, the answer, one answer that's come to me is simply only to print them myself to like self self publish them and only ever to sell them or give them to people who I've met and shown how to read them, which doesn't seem like such a that seems like a really viable possibility. <laughs> and, um, that would that it's a lot of effort to sort of go go about that, but it might be the only way they can they can happen. Um, and. You know, or I'm going to work on a, I'm going to work on an introduction and see if it's going to be possible. Um, I don't know. I don't know yet. But I, for at least a, I've been doing this for a couple of months, three or four months, um, trying to do readings in which I share in this way, and uh, and trying to figure the answer, trying to answer that question. Yeah. Kind of a comment and then a question. Okay. If you were to publish that. Yeah. You could have your first poem, which people would skip to the introduction to, making fun of people who don't read introduction. <laughs> <laughs> but, Just um, a shame. <laughs> 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 uh, so rhythm seems to be very, very important in your speaking of the poems. Uh, does that rhythm come after you? Because you were working through the rhythm in the second section of poems you were reading to us, you were working out rhythm to read yeah. about. Does it really happen after you've written a poem, or does that start before? Uh, I, it can't be separated in my mind. Uh, I think that certainly there are the, all of the different things that are happening with sound in the poems are happening from the beginning in the process of editing and the process of working on these poems was one in which the sound was a huge part of the experience of editing. I read them aloud, I listen to them, I read them next to other poems, I hear them, I work on them, I listen to them, and that's, that's the process by which they come to exist. Um, certainly, when I'm writing, 
when the very first parts of the poems arrive, they, there's a lot of what's happening is there, but not, it's not the same. You're still finding, I'm still finding in what I've written what I, what I heard. And in these, it's something a little more open than that. And I think what's, what's exciting about hearing everybody else read them is um, I, I read them differently. And we all, we read them, we naturally are going to read these poems differently. And I think that one of the hopes I have for the poems I write is that they uh, maintain a kind of capability of being, of, of having different kinds of rhythms inside them that you can, you as the reader can approach them. And, and even like poems like these first ones, I really think are at least as variable in their possible readings. Um, today I know, just due to wherever I'm at, I read fast. You know, I heard them and then I would slow myself down and <coughs> want to go fast again. And I, and I, I think that that's something that exists in a lot of poems, is that possibility of, of movement within that for the different readers. So I think about those things, or I, I don't know exactly I think about them as much as I try and enact them in the process of writing the poems, in the process of reading the poems. Uh, do you have like a, a note that you go to, or a specific thing that you habitually do that you know, fosters your creative thought process as a writer? Um, I would say, you know, again, I have a little notebook. I always, there's no, like if I'm out of bed, if I'm not horizontal, and most of the time that I am, I have that with me. Um, uh, so always, I, I, I think when I'm writing, when it is, when I feel myself in a space that's, that's working as a poet, there are times when I can't, and there are times much like, against my will and every possible thing I can, I can't write. But when I when I can, part of it is about making it all the all day, all the time thing. And there are places that I go. There isn't a, a location, but there are people I go to. But there are poets that I read. That it, it changes. It changes from day to day, month to month, year to year. But I. I find that there are certain people who excite me things. And I think even simply just reading, just reading, if I'm if I'm not there, I just read, I just read poems as much as I can until I can get into the space of those poems. And once I'm in the space of those poems, because for me, reading and writing poems is not a particularly different experience. They're very, very similar, and they're very, they open, um, and I kind of, if I'm getting a great experience reading the poem, I'm, I'm as fulfilled as when I'm writing, or maybe nearly as fulfilled as when I'm writing them. But it's really very much the same thing, and I find that if I can get into that space as a reader, soon enough I'll be in that space as a writer. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the way you uh, decided to choose the poems that you title or not title some of your poems, or maybe why some of your titles appear in the middle of the poem? Sure. Um, it's funny, I, um, my mother asked me this question today. <laughs> <laughs> so I've just answered this question. Um, so the, the experience for me for, for years and years has been mostly not to title poems. And I think it is in relation to um, the sense of the poems happening all the time. And that there is very little, like once a poem ends up in a book, once a poem ends up you know, in any sort of public space, it's almost made itself somewhat distinct from the things that happened around it, uh, the other writing that's happened around it. And, but for me, for most of the time, I'm, um, there is a kind of a blurred continuum of poetry being made. And my sense of uh, trying to isolate them and make them distinct as a thing is I don't, I don't have a desire for that. Like I want that, that blurred space. I, I feel their relation to each other and I want that relation to remain. I feel it's uh, not a, it's somewhat unbalanced. Like it often 
weeks for a little bit of a confusion, but I don't, I don't really want them to end. I think part of it is I don't want the poems to end. So if I don't, if I don't sort of formally begin them, they can't exactly formally end. And so I think that's part of it, so that when I title them, often it's in the middle, which sort of allows the beginning and end to trail off in these other ways. Um, I think that's I think that's the answer. And and I do also, and I try and say that a lot of this is not conscious at all. I mean, I really went like year, many many years not titling poems without exactly realizing I was not titling poems. <laughs> partially because almost all the poems I was reading were not titled. You know, I was reading lots of haiku. I was reading you know poems by by Chinese monks that were that were not titled poems. So I was reading. Emily Dickinson poems that were not titled. So the, the full range of uh, the poems that I was experiencing, or as we really long poems, the, the, the inside of which felt very removed from the kind of titles way back at the beginning. And so for me, it just, it just was never a natural, uh, not never, but it has not been for a long time a kind of given response to put a title on, onto something. So even now I say title, for me it's just simply underlying. You know, it's just like finding, every once in a while I find a title. And, uh, and that's kind of how I make them. Yeah. Okay, thank you Joshua.